Thank you. Welcome to this presentation about the EVE UI. My name is CCP Arrow. I'm currently holding the position of Game Design Director of EVE Online. Uh, but today I'm basically going to focus on talking about the EVE UI, how we are developing it, our methodology for it, and some of the features that are upcoming in the next, let's say, few months or, or near future. So we get a lot of feedback from you players regarding our EVUI, as you can expect. And if I would sum up uh, in a short sentence the feedback that I get from you guys, it would be, make it better. <laughs> and it's a very fair point. We actually say that to ourselves every day. We want to make the EVUI better. But what is better? Because better can mean very different things to different people. Yes. So it could be better identity. And identity meaning how we all kind of agree uh, that the characteristics or the core uh, values of the UI uh, tell us a certain story about it. So if we can all agree on that, then we all know where we want to take it. So that's a very uh, important foundation. But then there's better functionality, which basically means that it works as intended, technically. And then it also is better usability, where we are basically not just making it work uh, as intended, but the player himself feels that it is working well for him. It is mapping his mental model correctly. And this is maybe one of those things that we've uh, had more of challenges uh, in the past. So we want to focus a lot on this part. And then, last but not least, it's the aesthetics. So we feel it's very important as well that the aesthetics are good, because th that has a really big impact on the overall enjoyment of the UI. But it's definitely not a driver. The other things that become before it uh, are more important, and this kind of follows in the end. So to explain it a little bit, I'm going to give you a few examples. When we talk about identity, it's the brand perception, how we perceive something. So if you look at, for example, Han Solo, we all can agree pretty much what we feel about this character. Uh, if you would take crowdsourcing and you would have everyone kind of give out some explanations about what, what this means to you, we could probably group those uh, words together and make it form some kind of a sentence that everyone agrees on. We can also agree on a few uh, words about this uh, identity, which would then be maybe a little bit uh, different. But we would still all agree, kind of, overall. So that's the importance here, is that we have something that we can all associate with and agree on. So the reason I took this example, it kind of reminds me a little bit about Eve right now uh, in terms of the UI. We have this 10-year-old UI, slightly irritating, little out of praise, doesn't really fit in its environment, uh, but it has great potential to, be, to become something great, as we all know. Well, great or big or important. And then when we talk about functionality, uh, we talk about something working as intended. And I took this great example because we all know what you guys feel about the drone UI. Uh, but we can't really all agree that the functionality is, is there. It is working as intended. However, the usability of that isn't necessarily great. So that's something we want to focus on in the future. But we can't always just take example of things that are bad. What about the things that actually do work in the game? So when we take the example of usability, what is effect effective and efficient for the player, it's the fitting window. Now, I know some of you might say that it's not very efficient at picking what to fit, because there are other tools that give you more detailed and accurate information. But when it comes to actually dragging those things around putting them into the appropriate places, most users will say that they get the grasp of that very quickly and very early on in the game. 
because it's, it's usable. It's matching their mental model of how it should work. So we want to try and take that because we know that is something that works well and apply it to other areas where we don't have good usability. And then when we come to the aesthetics, the example there is that whenever you put some kind of a look and feel on something, uh, it has a lot to do with how you perceive something, it, how well you can read it, and et cetera. But you're not really changing anything uh, in regards to the game design decisions. So if we take an example here, when I go back and forth between two examples of uh, snake and ladders, you can see how the game is exactly the same but the board layout looks very different from each other. So that's the aesthetics. So whenever you see a mock-up that we create that has on the outside a lot of aesthetics, uh, that's not all we have to do. The most important thing is the actual gameplay and layout and dis design decisions that we make. So we can't have someone on the aesthetics level say, this ladder here in the middle looks bad because it's so long, I'm just going to shorten it. Then you're making decisions that are on the design level. You can, however, decide to say, I want the snakes to be red instead of green. That doesn't affect the gameplay. It can in some cases if you use color for information, but in this game it, it, it isn't doing that. So I thought this was a good example for how we uh, use aesthetics to make something uh, feel better but it's not really driving design decisions. So taking all of these things, the identity, the functionality, usability, and aesthetics, and applying them all together, we get the user experience. So the answer here is that better UI means a good user experience. So how do we make this possible? How do we do it? We need to start with a strategy. The strategy is the foundation. It's the building block before you start building the house itself. And then we need to focus on the user's needs. We need to, uh, through research and evaluations, realize what the users need to make the experience good. So we need to collaborate with the players. Because in the end, the players are the ones using the UI. And then once we've collaborated and gotten some insight into what is needed, we do rapid design prototypes. Because prototypes, are quick and easy, and we can easily do a lot of them and then see what works, and then we can invest more time uh, in development to do things more further. And we've done this, for example, recently regarding our uh, ISIS project, which you saw yesterday, the ship identification system. So we did a lot of prototypes within the client, tried out different things, and then ended up doing uh, one, one version of it once we saw what was working. So to explain a little bit about how we do these building blocks, and then I'm going to go into something interesting, I promise. We, we use the elements of the user experience. This is kind of the, the way we need to structure our work in order to get the uh, abstract to, to, to become concrete. So the abstract level that we start with is the strategy, which is the foundation. It's where we kind of ask ourselves, what is it that the users need? What are the business goals that we have? And what is, what is the overall brand vision? The next level then is the scope. So we figure out uh, a way to transform the strategy into some requirements. What are the UI features we'll include in this? And what are the func functional specifications? And what is the content that is required? Next comes the structure. Then we give shape to the scope. We figure out what workflows we need to have, what kind of tasks the user needs to do, and what information the user needs to get. And then we come to the skeleton. This is where it starts to get interesting. Then we are making the structure more concrete. Then we start doing the design prototypes. And using those prototypes, we actually verify and validate how the usability of the tasks that the users are doing is, how smooth is the workflow, and how readable is the content. And then the last bit, the surface, the aesthetics, is where we apply the art vision that we have. We put together the sensory design. I put the four main sensors, sensory design elements up there, but 
as you know, we mainly focus on the first. Uh, it would be great in the future maybe if we would uh, create some kind of a support for output so that you could smell it when someone smart bumps you. <laughs> but for now, we mainly focus on the, on the main ones that are the common ones. We apply a style guide to what we do. We make sure that the contrast and alignment is in order and we make sure that the, there's consistency because not only does that look better, but it also uh, is easier to learn to use if things are consistent. The colors need to be right, and the fonts need to be readable uh, and, and in, in, in style with everything else. So when we're doing UI, we have a process. We start with research, where we kind of get all the information we need to, to base our decisions. What are the customers asking? What are the metrics telling us? What is their overall vision? What does the business want? And what is the brand asking us to do? And then we take all of that data and we put together these user experience uh, methodologies where we map the journey of the user. We create task models, but we also have to create personas. So this is a tricky subject for Eve because there's so many play styles. But even though you prefer doing a lot of things, when you're doing a certain thing with a certain UI, you're always doing it in a certain way. So we can always map that, even though you have a complex personality when it comes to play style. And then we move to the design phase, where we basically take all of this insight from the user experience uh, vision, and we apply it to uh, these different ideas. We make prototypes, and we see what works by actually having players or potential users try them out. And then once we see something really working, then we move it to the development stage. So we're not investing too much time uh, doing some engineering work and then seeing it actually fail on a test client too late in the process. So that's the process for doing UI. And now I'm gonna do, uh, instead of just telling you the way we do it, I'm gonna show you some of the results. So I'm gonna show you some examples. I'm gonna put my money where your mouse is, if that's something that makes sense. So first off, uh, as you saw in the uh, built client yesterday, we've recently done some work to the character selection screen, and this is the work of uh, Team Kuromaku, one of our feature teams. They've been doing a great work on this front, but what you see in the client is a result of a lot of uh, prototyping and, and trial and error. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of insight into how that team uh, did their uh, development. So they started off with what we call a journey mapping. We map the uh, journey of the player, uh, and we use a certain persona that we have in mind. So in this uh, example, we took Lisa and Maggie, Lisa being an experienced player that had, uh, was using all of her character slots, uh, and then Maggie was just a very new player that had never uh, created an account before and was going through the whole step uh, for the first time. And, and this is not, the same as a task model where you basically just put together uh, the exact uh, key inputs or, or mouse clicks. This is where we are mapping out the, the need of the user. I go into the game, I want to see what character I can use, I select it, I evaluate that I wanna use it, and then I go in. So this is more kind of a mental thing. And then we try to uh, figure out the potential that we might have on each step, the, the pain points, the problems we might uh, have to solve, and then it, below the green there, you, uh, you get all the kind of uh, requirements that we need to basically do to make these things work. So we list out the things that we need to develop or the things that we need to design so that this uh, journey will actually make sense for the player. And then we evaluate it in detail. So we take the, uh, the steps here in the green post-its and we ask ourselves the five whys. Why do, does the player want to do this? And then we maybe answer it. And we, we say, okay, why is that? And then the more we ask ourselves why, we kind of get deeper and deeper into the core essence reasons for why a player wants to do a certain thing. And then we can add these post-its above it with the yellow kind of uh, trying to map out the, the thought process so that we can kind of make sure that we're thinking about all the use cases and the kind of corner cases as well, because we have players that have a lot of 
Etsy special cases when they want to uh, select a certain character. There might be players that want to see if their character is in factional warfare. There might be players that want to see if they're in a certain station. They're using a certain ship because maybe they just remember which uh, ship they were flying. They don't remember which character they were using the last time. So all these things we need to kind of keep in mind when we are creating something that allows the player to make the decision of what character to choose because that is the essential uh, reasoning for a character selection screen. So this is all very quick uh, and can be done very easily and it doesn't require any coding so we like doing these things and we try to put them up on, the, on any wall that we see is, uh, has free space at the office. But then we move on to some uh, very kind of very rapid kind of design prototypes where we just basically uh, you know, design something with uh, not even great artist, artistic skills. We just put something together that is uh, informative enough so that we know uh, what it presents or represents. And then we move stuff around to basically decide where things should be located. Where does it make the most sense for the player to enter the game, to select the character, to do all the different things that this menu needs to uh, cater to? And this can easily be changed. I mean, this is, this is a screenshot of, of basically the same thing, and we've just, or, or the team has just placed uh, things in different ways to see how it works. And of course, this could be done in Photoshop or in, in client, but this takes seconds, while the other takes maybe minutes or hours. And then once uh, the team has decided where it makes most sense to have something located, they start to dive more into the details of what actually is the user be, going to be able to interact with on, on each of these levels. Uh, here, for example, is a, a kind of a workflow of how you use the redeeming system. And then, once we have a, a, a clearer picture of how things need to be laid out and where they're located and what uh, they're going to be uh, allowing us to, to do and, and see, then we can take it to a more uh, nice uh, concepting stage where we start to see these beautiful mockups uh, that, that show us how this could potentially look in the end. And then uh, some things that we also like to do a lot uh, when we get, have the time to do it is create animated mockups. So here you can see how the, the screen would start. And this uh, is important for us both in terms of just uh, de defining the, the overall uh, animation styles so that we can then decide how the hovering and, and all these different feedbacks you need to get when you're interacting with the elements, how they will uh, behave. And I'm going to show it one more time. I hope the screens here do it justice. And here you start to see the uh, more kind of more recent uh, version of it, which is kind of what we see in the, in the uh, uh, test client today where we had to uh, have the team you know, create certain colors for the theming because as you saw in the mockups before, they were all blue, but the uh, next expansion will have a, a red hue to it. So the team developed a way to do that in a very uh, nice manner so they can actually define a certain amount of uh, color palettes for each expansion and, and it changes the whole uh, layout drastically. So here we see a mock-up that shows how the redeeming system will work, uh, and this is very close to how it is in the build client. And then uh, a little bit upper there is a, is a way for players to uh, destroy their uh, clone, and then maybe they want to change their mind. They're like, oh no, I was drunk yesterday, and I'm, I don't actually want to get rid of this guy, and I can, I can reverse that process. So that's showing the different states of that. But maybe they just want something that's uh, a little bit more direct and just uh, gives you a little bit more information about what you're actually doing. So the, the, the task of actually manufacturing something uh, can just be uh, validated before you even hit the button to, to put something uh, into manufacture. So these are just some ideas that we concept uh, using these processes and met methodologies that I told you about earlier. So we can invest uh, you know, not a lot of time into just doing these uh, things in, in all kinds of directions, but in order for us to know which of these uh, ideas is the right one, we need to take it through the steps. We need to validate them, we need to have them user tested. So none of these things will, will just pop all of a sudden and you, you'll not be able to uh, understand manufacturing. It'll have a process to it and you'll be able to uh, uh, speak to us about it. But these, these are just the, the kind of ideas that we come up with. 
So it's, it's kind of exciting to uh, see how something can be so drastic. It's either something like this or, or something like this. But this could be just as good. This could be just as usable. So it just uh, depends on what we want to do with those things. Here's something crazy as well. So this is uh, where it starts to get very interesting. Here we're actually doing uh, concepts that are taking the whole UI, the whole Eve UI, and just revamping the style of it, the aesthetics, uh, but also, of course, the usability. We would never go through a process like this uh, without uh, taking a, a huge dive into, into usability improvements. But this, this gives us a good idea for, for the kind of uh, artistic vision that we want to take uh, the features we're doing. So even though we won't be able to maybe tackle this all at once, it's good to have something to, to uh, move to. Because once, uh, once we start doing new features that might not necessarily uh, be something that you see in this screenshot, we at least know what kind of a style we should apply there, because at some point we might want to do these, and then we want it all to match. So it's good to do these uh, artistic mockups to get uh, inspired about some uh, specific style for the UI. But uh, the style is, of course, as I told you before, just the aesthetics. The, the backbone is the usability and functionality. So we will definitely uh, improve those as well, and not just jump directly to improving the, uh, the visuals. Here's another version uh, that is showing how it looks on a bright background. So in the past, we've sometimes had some UI elements that work really well in, in one mode where you're in a very dark and gloomy uh, space, but when you move into space that has very bright nebulas and stuff like that, it kind of becomes unreadable. So here we're basically making sure that the, the concept uh, caters to those needs So, today at one o'clock, we will have a UI roundtable where you can discuss these ideas with me in detail. I will have a laptop, so I'm actually gonna take notes and, and, and use this information. It's not just something you're, you're saying and, and it just goes into oblivion. It's gonna be actually used in our research. We're gonna have you uh, kind of define with us the, the core values of the UI. What is it that we think the UI should stand for? Is it customizability? Is it identity? What are the things that you think matters for the EVUI in the future? And uh, then we're gonna do some uh, fun UI brainstorming where we can kind of maybe elaborate a little bit on these uh, uh, crazy ideas that we have and, and see if there's any of them that make sense to you. And how we then go about uh, doing uh, follow-up on that kind of a brainstorming is we, we take these different types of players, which of course are a lot of, and of course these groups that are shown here are just a small portion, and you might actually even uh, fit into all of them. Uh, we're not saying that you, you can only do one of these things, but when you're doing a certain task in the UI, uh, uh, at least you're doing one of those at a time. You can't really do uh, multiple at a time, and, and then we map out the, the tasks and the behaviors that we need to cater to for each and every one of those. So we take the ideas that come out of these brainstorming sessions, we collect them together, we organize them so they make sense, and then we place them in our heads and see how they uh, work uh, together. And if we see some patterns that might actually work, then we will take these ideas back and group them into their appropriate uh, categories. And then we'll take the ones that are, have, have a very uh, fine creative uh, insight uh, which might be interesting to uh, explore further, but also uh, are realistic, because we need to be able to do this uh, within a certain time frame. We can't just say, we want to do something, it'll take 10 years. So it has to be something realistic, but it also needs to be creative. So the sweet spot is where the ideas will uh, be used the most. Because in the end, we want to reach that moment where we can say that the, the things that we uh, feel about the game that we play, this uh, greatest science fiction uh, universe that we know, is that we can actually say it maps our mental model to how we feel a science fiction universe should be in, in 21,000 uh, years in the future. And uh, we see some of this in our trailers, uh, so we, we would love to be able to see this in our game. And this is uh, what we are striving for, uh, the UI guys at CCP, for the, next, uh, for the next months and years. 
So thank you very much. So if you have any questions, please come and, and talk into the microphone. And then if you are, are one of those introverts that just wants to kind of go on a one-on-one -on -one or maybe come to the round table, that's fine too. Not saying that only introverts are going to go to the round table, of course, but yep. Um, well, for the new, all, all of this new AI stuff, you just, uh, UI stuff you've been talking about, some people like their game to look like Windows 95. Uh, would it be possible going forward that we could always keep the current system that there is and have the ability to choose to use that and then if we do add like more features to the other one, we create them very simplified in this minimalistic UI that some people's computers, that's just all that it can handle in certain aspects, I guess, if they're low-end rigs. Yeah, so one of the reasons why we want you to kind of uh, help us with defining the identity is because the identity kind of tells us what it stands for. Does it stand for a customizable UI that can look uh, any way a player wants it to look? Or is it something that kind of has this defined style that everyone can associate with when they see screenshots from the game? Well, well the other thing about that too is um, eventually as you get into EVE and you start playing years after years, you don't need that information in front of you. You can already tell like what's going on just by looking at your overview or such. You don't need to see that. Um, I'm being jammed by this specific pilot. Yeah, I can tell I'm being jammed by a Falcon. Yeah, I mean, the way users want the, uh, the feedback and, and the information is, is in a different way. It's hard to find one solution that fits uh, all, but maybe we can find something that fits, uh, you know, the, the bigger audience. And we haven't defined a certain way to do it. We just want that kind of to be a, a collaboration and discussion between us and the players. We just know that because the players are saying make it better, uh, there's some work to be done. But okay. we haven't said that we just are going to do it this way or that way. It's going to be a collaboration with the players uh, in terms of how we're going to tackle it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi, you showed off some uh, cool changes to the interface, some things to look forward to, but uh, one of the older mechanics is particularly POS management and how we manage all that stuff. Are there any plans to improve that, especially with respects to uh, moon mining reactions, how all that stuff is linked? Yeah, I mean, of course, uh, the way improvements to the UI work is it's, it's essentially just the, the top layer of the game design. Uh, you can't really do a lot of stuff uh, in the UI in terms of huge changes unless you're affecting the game design as well. So because we're going through that effort, we always want to do it also uh, by actually reevaluating things on the game design level. However, sometimes it's not good to invent the wheel. Uh, there are some things that actually do work uh, from like a core game design level. We just need to message it better. But I definitely agree. There are some things uh, uh, from the lower game design level that needs to be uh, re-looked at. And we always, because we have the UI designers and the game designers together in the department, we always have that discussion uh, very early on. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thank right, you. So you talked about your usability model, but do you really actually use some of the users? <laughs> As an example, the undock button, it was moved up uh, a few patches ago. It really didn't need to be moved. <laughs> In, yeah, in no. addition, there's, there's other aspects like uh, now when you undock from stations, you get that nice little circle thing that pops up sometimes. Never needed it. Don't know why it's there. But that's, that's the interesting thing about our players. Uh, there are some things that some players don't need at all that other players uh, prefer or, or use a lot. Uh, but it, of course, you know, if, if, if you know, a lot of our players or a lot of our use uh, test subjects are going to say one thing, then we need to investigate that further. Um, so I mean, you know, on the outside it might look like we just moved the button up there, but maybe there were like some things that showed us that it would be okay over time, people would evolve. But of course, in some cases, a change is always gonna be a change to behavior. So even though it make, makes sense to new players, it doesn't make sense to those that have been doing it for many, many years. And we, we recognize that. We know that that's, that's an issue. We need to make sure that we're not uh, breaking things for those that have become masters at using the UI for 10 years. Even though it's not the perfect usable UI in the world, they have become really good at using it in the way that it is currently. So that's going to be the big challenge for us, is to cater to those two groups. 
So uh, some people may know my alliance uh, in Jelly Mortis from uh, the post of about uh, removing the sun. I'm not actually the one that proposed removing the sun, but have you thought about ways to mitigate some of the contrast issues when you have a really bright background? Yeah, so one of the, uh, of course, like you saw in the concept, I mean, one way to do it would be to just uh, create a new UI that just has a better way to cater to those uh, situations. Uh, but for the uh, short-term solution, uh, we recently started using DirectX 11 that allows us uh, a lot of new uh, shading uh, capabilities. So maybe there's a way for us to have the text uh, switch itself so it goes to dark when it has a bright background and then back again. Uh, I mean, we're gonna investigate this a little bit further. We wanna find something that makes sense uh, because putting a very dark shadow on everything, of course, would fix it, but it wouldn't look great. Thank so, you. I mean, we will definitely investigate that. Thank you. We're not going to remove the sun. No, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, yep. Is there any way in the world you can give us more than 250 court bookmarks? <laughs> With an extensive jump bridge network and a good POS setup for a corp, you're done. You don't have any, you, there's no way to do a tactical. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll ask my engineers. They usually give me a, uh, Sometimes they give me a good answer. Sometimes they give me a really long uh, technical reason why things are the way they are. Um, I mean, they would probably prefer that us game designers would just figure out a way for players not needing as many. They would just ha have a better efficient way to kind of you know, use bookmarks. But whatever we come up with, uh, we're listening to feedback. So if, if, that's, if that's something that really is breaking gameplay, we will look at it. Yeah. Which is, of course, the overall user experience is good, not good when you have something that, like that. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. All right. Thank you very much. One more. Oh, yep. Sorry. Uh, just a whoa. just a quick one. Um, are you guys ever going to incorporate jump bridges into the map? Because I would love to see my alliance network. Enough to have like two browsers and all that. So the map. Uh, Not just like the alliance. I know it's already incorporated, but I mean like the blue network and the. Yeah. Yeah. So any any kind of changes to the map? I mean, it comes down to a lot of the decisions that we meet, need to make uh, in terms of like there are systems that are just kind of old. So if we do any kind of small iterations, even though on the outside it doesn't look like much, we have to t tinker with code that's like been there for a long time. So if we ever do do any kind of like revisiting of the star map, there's a lot of things waiting for us there, and that's definitely one of them. Yeah. All right. So one o'clock round table about the UI. You can put a dent in the universe. Thank you.